I was exposed to the sovereignty of God in such a powerful way of, of taking be getting beauty from ashes. And it was, a, it was one of those events in my life that really has, has um, informed the rest of my life. Even my work in Frontier Markets has been informed by understanding God's sovereignty, that, that in the difficult times and places, God is faithful. We built a company there that went from zero to 200 million in revenue in about three and a half years. Wow. It was a rocket ship. And so everything we do has to have that discipleship, that leadership development in the mud. Hmm. That is the purpose, not the business. It's good. It touches people. It's an economic engine, but really it's about leadership development. That's what changes things. Welcome to a new episode of uh, Guild Podcast. Here we want to talk about faith and uh, business and how do we integrate them. And our purpose is to create a movement that uh, will help entrepreneurs and we give resources and will help them uh, create businesses for the Amen. kingdom of God. Amen. And uh, today we are privileged to have a special guest. It's uh, Kurt Laird that has uh, much experience in uh, um, Frontier Markets. He's a very good investor there and uh, has more than uh, uh, 13 years experience only in Afghanistan, but he has been working in uh, like 30 countries and uh, he has a passion for God's kingdom development there and he was involved in many projects and uh, even uh, now uh, he's uh, consulting uh, uh, startups in Africa and uh, he's creating structure for uh, funding uh, um, and uh, investment fund with mm -hmm. the impact in kingdom of God. So welcome, Kurt. We are so blessed to have you here Thank today. Thank you. <laughs> It is a blessing to be here. I, I remember coming to Romania the first time in 1990 and uh and romania has really held a spot in my heart uh god called me to other places i tried to start some businesses here so it's great to come back and to see the progress and also to meet you and see what guild faith is doing it's exciting wow i think it's a it's a big difference uh... a big difference <laughs> a big difference yeah so um Kurt, please share a little bit about your background, about your uh, journey in, in, in business and uh, um, how did you arrive here today? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was born in Canada and we, my parents were Christian workers. My dad was a pilot mm. uh, with an organization, Christian organization. So we moved down to Ecuador when I was two years old. And he flew an airplane in the jungles the, of the Amazon. And growing up as a, as a kid, I, one of the, the defining experiences of my life was meeting the men, the, the nationals there who had killed five Christian workers back in the 50s. Mm. And out of that tragedy, these men had come to know the Lord as their, as their Lord and Savior. And as a child, I was exposed to the sovereignty of God in such a powerful way of, of taking be getting beauty from ashes. And it was, a, it was one of those events in my life that really has, has um, informed the rest of my life. Even my work in Frontier Markets has been informed by understanding God's sovereignty that that in the difficult times and places, God is faithful. So I, I went from there. My, my parents then moved to New Guinea. So I grew up in, on the island of New Guinea and another fascinating place to live. Uh, it, was, it was a delight as a child to live. We, we played in the jungles. We explored some of my, some of my friends there. Uh, interestingly enough, had actually tasted human flesh. Wow. Now that sounds crazy, but they had just years before, they had been cannibals and they had come to know the Lord and had been saved out of that. But they were, um, they were incredible followers of Jesus in, in that country. 
and I had the privilege of growing up in that place. It was adventurous. It was frontier. And so it's no, it's no um, accident that I have gone on to be able to work in these kinds of places because this is, this is what I know. So I went to boarding school in Malaysia. I went back to the U.S. and got my engineering degree. And then I I decided I wanted to start my own business or I wanted to be in business. I'd been in corporate, so I turned in all my stock options. I took all my savings, all my retirement, and I bought a little bankrupt security systems business. So we were Mm -hmm. doing uh, CCTVs. We were doing uh, card swipes. It was just a small business, about a million dollars a year. Uh, and, and I bought it, it had gone bankrupt and I Mm -hmm. bought it to turn it around. And I learned, uh, so many things in that, including about the sovereignty of God, because I say now never trust an entrepreneur unless they have calluses on their knees. You're (laughs) like, why would calluses on your knees? Because each month in the beginning, I would get down on my knees at the end of the month and say, dear God, where is the payroll coming from? <laughs> and I got calluses on my knees. And so it's like that is the experience of an entrepreneur is to be in those positions where you're building something and it's beautiful and you have to trust God that God is going to provide. So I sold that. And interestingly enough, uh, a wrong phone number call came into my, my place in the beginning of 2001. And that was before 9-11. And I, it wound up being an old friend of mine, but he had called the number in air. Hmm. And we talked and come to find out he was working in Afghanistan in a nonprofit. And we talked and I told him of my joy of building businesses, my desire to build them in frontier markets. At the end of the conversation, he said, Kurt, this call was not a coincidence. I said, yeah, you know, that's the way God works. When 9-11 happened and then the U.S. and the coalition went into Afghanistan, I suddenly was like, I need to get into Afghanistan and help with business. The only person I knew was this man. So I called him and I found myself in Afghanistan three months later. And I fell in love with Afghanistan. It's a majestic, it's a mystical place that just draws you in and, and... and put something in your soul that just calls you back. And so I fell in love with it. And another coincidence that God brought a man into the office I didn't even know. He overheard me talking about wanting to start businesses. He said, I'm starting the mobile phone company. And I said, I'd love to be part of that. So six months later, I was part of the founding team of the national mobile phone company in Afghanistan. Hmm. And it was an amazing ride because this is 2003. There was nothing there. I, I, I think that there's probably some parallels to right after the revolution, right after Ceausescu was gone, 89, 90, where Romania was, it. there was not a lot here, right? And Afghanistan was similar. And it was just full of opportunities and full of possibilities. And so we built a company there that went from zero to 200 million in revenue in about three and a half years. Wow. It was a rocket ship. We had one example. We thought our business plan said that we would have six, uh, 12,000 customers in six months. 12,000 customers in six months. That's what the business plan said. We had 12,000 customers in six days. It was crazy. They, I mean, crazy things were happening. It was like a rocket ship. And in that, I fell in love again with business, building businesses. So anyway, that's a little bit of my story up to there. Um, I then wrote a book about uh, my experiences so that's that's the beginning of my my journey. Wow, Kurt, that sounds amazing. Uh, <laughs> you didn't get time to get bored into <laughs> no, no, we this didn't. Journey. <laughs> no, it's like I I was um, I was in charge of all the regions, and we had an airplane, and so I got to travel to every corner of Afghanistan. 
there was definitely danger, but that also, it, it, it makes you alive. There's a certain when you when you're in a situation where you're building something and there's a bit of risk and a bit of danger, it actually really narrows your perspective. There was one time I was in the west of of Afghanistan in 2004, and I was setting up the business there, and I got a call from the U.S. Embassy, and the lady on the other end who I knew. She said, Kurt, she was like desperate, Kurt, get to the, get to the U.S. military base right now. They're hunting you. Wow. And I was standing there in my, um, uh, in my guest house, which was right above my office. I was standing there and I remember the fear starting from my toes. Literally, I could feel the fear starting from my toes and coming right up here because there's nothing worse than this feeling of being hunted. And what had happened was uh, one of the warlords had been taken out by the U.S. Army and the Afghan Army, and the, his followers were hunting for any foreigners, mm. and I was one of the most prominent foreigners in that city, and they were hunting me along with other people. They were hunting me. But I remember at that moment... Life became so simple and pure because nothing else mattered than, than just that moment and what were the priorities. I, I knew that everything I owned was going to be destroyed. And I think that what it gave me was an insight into how God actually wants us to live is in that simple faith, simple, pure faith. The things of the world at that moment didn't matter. It was me and God. It was me and survival. It was me and and my destiny. It was right there. And I think that that's one of the ways that God wants us as we're doing business, as we're living life, is that simplicity of faith in him that, that he is our priority. Now, what happened then was she said, get there. But I knew that I had a number of my employees who were not American citizens. They were foreigners, but they couldn't get into the army base. And I just, it wasn't even, I didn't even think about it really. But it was like, I can't go to the army base myself. Sure, I will be safe, but what about my employees? So we stuck it out. And thankfully, the mob that was coming our direction didn't come all the way to our office. I was having to decide. I had armed guards and I was having to make the decision. If they come, do I tell my guards to shoot them to protect me? Or do I let them come in and go ahead and take me, but my employees will be safe? Because as soon as you shoot, you, you've, you've crossed the Rubicon, we say. You've crossed that line where now it is, it is life and death. And uh, I, I, I didn't have to make that decision, but it was one of those events in my life where that purity was just a beautiful, a beautiful illustration of how God wants us to live our life. Wow. So lots of stories like that. Lots of adrenaline. <laughs> lots of adrenaline, yes. And, and I, I understand soldiers much better who have that adrenaline uh, all the time, so... Kurt, tell us a little bit uh, about Re Frontier. Um, how, um, how how did you come with the idea? What is the vision there? Yeah. How would you like to contribute? So what I interestingly what I did was in Afghanistan, I worked um, for a man called the Aga Khan. The Aga Khan is a Muslim businessman, very progressive very uh very modern mm -hmm. so and very successful businessman but he was also the spiritual leader of the ismailis and he was the man who had invested the 51% in the mobile phone company why did he do that because what he did was he had followers in afghanistan but he looked at afghanistan and he said how do i increase the human flourishing of Afghanistan as a whole. Hmm. Because 
I know that if I increase the, the human flourishing of Afghanistan, my people will also flourish. But he was very altruistic and very generous. And he's like, how do I do that? So he looked and he said, I need an economic engine to drive this. So he invested in the mobile phone company, became a billion dollar, a billion dollar company. He invested in a five-star hotel in the middle of in the middle of Kabul. He invested in agro processing. He invested in all kinds of economic benefits. But he also then said, we also need, if we're looking at human flourishing, that deals with health. And so I'm going to put in the best hospital, the world-class hospital. I'm going to put in schools, universities. And he had this holistic strategy to say, how does this stuff how does all of this work together? The for-profit and the non-profit strategically, they're aligned for maximum impact, for maximum, for shifting the dial of human flourishing. And as I sat there in the middle of, of that in 2005, I was saying, why am I building this billion dollar company for this man? And it was one of those times where I felt like God spoke to me, not audibly, but he spoke to me. And he said, Kurt, listen and learn. And then he asked me the question that has haunted me. He said, why is there no Christian who has the vision of the Aga Khan? Hmm. Why is there no Christian? Why is there no Christian group that has that vision? And the question is, why isn't there? Hmm. This man had a whole country vision. So I'm now in Kenya. Uh, we moved from Afghanistan. We went to Nigeria for two years. I invested in some businesses there. My wife was working for the British government. We then moved to Kenya. Well, the Aga Khan is big in Kenya also. He has the best hospital, the best schools. Again, he has hotels. He has hydropower. He has all of these things. And they're all aligned. He has the best business bank. He has the best insurance company. He has a national media company. But it's all for human flourishing of Kenya. And so what ReFrontier is, the vision of ReFrontier is to build a strategically aligned economic engine and a nonprofit that combine together to look at the entire country and have the vision for the entire country and look for, for us as Christians, the Old Testament uh, concept of shalom mm. is human flourishing. It's not just peace, right? Shalom is this idea of wholeness and completeness. And in the, in the Old Testament, the picture that they use of shalom is a picture of um, of a wall. Hmm. And the, there are bricks missing from this wall, right? So if there are, you could have a wall that's 99%, 99.9%, 9 but if it has missing bricks, it's not fulfilling its purpose. Yes. The enemy, the animals, whatever can come in. So the shalom is actually the concept is to complete the wall so that it serves its purpose. If you look on a national level, you look at Romania and you say, where are the missing bricks of shalom for, for Romania? 99.9% .9 of all the ingredients can be there, but there's some missing bricks that are keeping human flourishing less than it could be, less than Romania was designed for, less than Kenya was designed for. And so if we can identify those missing bricks, then God can give us the ability to say, what are those missing bricks? And we can begin to work to fill those missing bricks. And in the process, we increase human shalom or, or human flourishing. And that draws people to Jesus. That Because we are concerned about justice and prosperity and health and all of these things, equality, all of these things, it helps us to, to meet that. And we draw people to Jesus. So that's so refrontier the model of refrontier is the economic engine the nonprofit we're an investment fund that will buy and hold companies to build those companies as an economic engine for this and that is 
what we're looking and then we want to prototype it in Kenya and then take it to other places that are maybe even more difficult. Wow, so. I, I really love the idea and the concept and uh, if this can contribute to human flourishing and to this shalom that you're talking about that will bring people to Jesus and uh, change the lives, uh, it's going to transform Kenya and maybe other countries too because that other countries relate to yeah. Kenya. Well, and I think this is what you guys are, this is what you guys um, are looking at doing and mm. are already doing. The interesting thing is I talked with, um, with Kenyans uh, and said, what are those missing bricks? Because I can't, I, from the West, I, I'm not bringing the solutions. Mm -hmm. The solutions are all, they're there. What are those missing bricks? And the, the one that every single time came up was that they needed shifted leaders. Mm -hmm. They needed people who thought differently, had different solutions, Kenyans. So I started looking at that and I started thinking, what we need to do is everything else that we have is, a, is an engine or a tool for developing leaders. Everything we do, business, nonprofit, we should have shifting leaders is the core of everything we do. So then as I was, as I was thinking of that, we started watching the program The Chosen, hmm. which I understand is dubbed or yes we uh, have it in romanian yeah in romanian yes. and i love my wife and i katrina and i watch that and we weep almost every single episode because it's so powerful yes and if you look at that you see that jesus was in the mud literally it it really portrays that he was literally in the mud with his disciples hmm. developing them and what did he do to develop them He didn't just sit there in a room and teach them the 21 laws of leadership, right? He took them out as he was healing, as he was preaching, and he's giving them a chance to, to go out. He's, he's in the mud with them, and then when they failed, he picks them up. Good old Peter was failing all the time, but Jesus saw in him the potential to change the world, and he kept picking him up. And so I thought... How do you take that model that Jesus was the master scaler? He took those 12, the 70, and he scaled the church through them to change the entire world. So how is he going to change Romania? How is he going to change Kenya? How is he going to change America? America is going through some really difficult times now. The way it's going to be is through leaders who have been in the mud with Jesus and have been in the mud with other leaders who shift, who see new possibilities, and then they go out and they shift and they change Romania, they change the world. And so everything we do has to have that discipleship, that leadership development in the mud. Hmm. That is the purpose, not the business. It's good. It touches people. It's an economic engine, but really it's about leadership development. That's what changes things. That's a very different uh, uh, seeing of, of, yes, of a business. Yes, but, but it's what you guys are doing. And I, I <clears throat> really appreciate that. You guys have, from the beginning, you're like, we need to develop disciples. Hmm. And that, I just, I think that is the core of everything else. From there, you build it and you figure out how do we scale building disciples? Yeah. How do we get in the mud with them? We've got to be in the mud. Kurt, please uh, share with us some principles for investing. You have investment in different countries. Uh, you have invested in different businesses over the time. Uh, please give us some principles that uh, you look at when you invest, or how do you do your investments? Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good question. And I I have one main criteria, and that's the person. I invest in people hmm. because. People is number one, it's who Jesus loves. And so I'm in I am interested in that person's growth. Whether they're a Christian, whether they're a Muslim, I want them to grow. I want them to become better fathers, better mothers. Uh, I want them to be better community leaders. So I look for people that I can invest in. Mm -hmm. Character has to be part of that. But the idea itself is less important than the person because 
general, very often, the idea will fail. Um, some political situation will happen and the idea will become untenable. But the person is still there. Hmm. And if that person has the drive and has the creativity and the character, they'll pick themselves up and they'll be able to then go to the next thing. So one example, an interesting example, is we've invested in a small potato farm in the middle of Nigeria. You think, what? what is that? Well, I looked at, at agriculture in Nigeria, which is also true in Kenya, and it is lots of small farms. And the reality is that a country will never grow beyond a certain point with small farmers. You have to be able to scale. You've got to be able to figure out how to get economies of scale. And so what I did was I recruited an IT person as my farm manager. Why is that? He knew how he knew he was in an area where there was lots of expertise, but he had good character. I knew him for a long time. I knew he had good character. And he was able, with his IT background, to actually go in and make data-driven decisions on agriculture. Hmm. And he said to me, nobody's doing this in this area. This is unheard of. And he got a lot of um, opposition because they were like, are you trying to show us up? Are you, you're trying something new? And, and so we have invested in this. And he, we drive every decision by data. And, and this is a new thing that we then are starting with a prototype. But then we want to grow it and then enlist other farmers who will make the same decisions. We'll look at eventually to export, but everything will be made on those kind of decisions. So we chose him because character and because I knew that this man had the skills and the resilience that if we failed at potatoes, we'll find something else for him. So that, I think, more than anything is the people. And that's my philosophy in when I own a business is people development people development that is and i think that's because partly because that's what jesus cares about wow so thank you so much for sharing with us yeah you also wrote a book uh, culture key uh, investing and entrepreneurship in frontier markets and uh, there you have a, a belief tool mm. uh, maybe you can share a little bit with us about the belief tool I, I can, and I think the, the book was written um, because I saw so much work and investment in frontier markets that was failing for cultural reasons, for cult because of cultural innocence. A lot of the American investments were, were just being, were, were, they, they didn't have cultural intelligence and they were making huge mistakes. But I, but I saw also that much of the cultural education that they were being given was just mainly a list of do's and don'ts. You know, don't, don't uh, give anything with your left hand in Indonesia. Don't show the bottom of your feet. Don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But what do you do when that list runs out? They didn't know what to do because they didn't have a framework. And so I said, let's create a framework to help people to navigate cultural um, dynamics and also mindset dynamics. So what I did was I, in my own leadership training, we dealt with, what, that I went through, we dealt with mindsets. We, and we looked at what are your beliefs that drive your behavior or drive your actions. So think of it as a, a circle, and I'll simplify it. There's a, a big a circle, and inside there's like a, a bullseye, mm -hmm. another circle in the middle. And in the very middle of the circle is beliefs. And the next circle out is behaviors or actions. And what this says is that every action, every behavior is driven by a belief. 
when you see an action, if you are curious, you can follow it back to a belief that drives that action. Now, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you are walking down a dark alley, a dark street in Cluj, very dark. And a man walks towards you and he has his hand behind his back. Hmm. What will your reaction be? Well, you will be scared that he wants to do something. <laughs> You'll be scared. So you see his action and you interpret his action based on your belief. Yes. Right? And so what comes out of that? Fear. And what's the action that happens? You run, mm -hmm. right? Now, let's say that that man actually has a dozen roses behind his back that he wants to give you as a gift. If you knew that, how would you feel? <laughs> Surprised. Surprised, yeah. <laughs> and you'd be happy, yeah. right? You wouldn't run away. Now, if he had the roses behind him and you ran away screaming, he would look at that and go, What's what, this? what is this? So that action that of him having his hand behind his back, you can interpret, depending on your belief, you interpret it in two different ways. If you believe it's roses, you're happy. If you believe it's a gun or a knife, you're scared and you run the other way. Mm. So what happens often in cross-cultural situations is we come and we see an action and we interpret that action based on our belief. They are acting out of their belief. And what happens very often is those beliefs are different and they con there, there's a conflict. And this happens all the time in cross-cultural situations. If we are not curious about discovering those beliefs that are in them, then we will misinterpret. So we have to get really good at seeing people's actions and being curious about what the belief is. So this is really even in, in marriage, right? In marriage, men and women are different. And if we don't interpret the actions and the words of our wife or our husband and are curious about where it comes from, we interpret it based on our belief, hmm. right? And very often that can be conflict. Cross-culturally, it can be conflict. And so, unfortunately, what happens with a lot of investors coming into frontier markets is they are coming in with their, often Western, let's say American Western, and they come in and they make decisions based on how they see things rather than being curious about how the person in the frontier or emerging market sees things and they make bad decisions. And so the, I'll, I'll tell you a story. There's, there's, a, there's a mindset or a belief in many frontier markets that is the survival mindset. Mm -hmm. So take Afghanistan. We came into Afghanistan right after 30 years of war, right? They have, they, they have been in the middle of civil war. They went through the Taliban. They are just surviving. They're barely surviving. They, they, they're, they're worried about today. They're not worried about tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't, may not come. There's situations during the Civil War where two men would be walking down the street in Kabul and a rocket would come in. They would fall to the ground to, to, to avoid it. One man would get up, the other man's dead mm -hmm. because of some piece of shrapnel. So they're, they're just, they're worried about today. So we went to build, uh, to refit our office, our first office, and I hired this Afghan to put in eight uh, split unit air conditioners. I come back, and the 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 inside unit is is tilted. 
the 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 um, the pipes are wrapped. The tape is falling out. He's put it through the window. The window is cracked. He tried to make a hole in the window, and it cracked the window. Hmm. And they they worked, but they were they would never have lasted. So I said to him, "Fix it, or I'm not going to pay you." He's like, "No, you need to pay me." I said, "You need to fix it." He said, "No, you pay me." If you don't pay me, I'm going to the police. Wow. I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? What's going on? Now, I started to make a judgment because what? I'm seeing his action, which doesn't make sense in my, in my belief. So I said to him, look, if you know that we're going to grow this company to be huge, you know that. If you fix those eight, I will give you a hundred more to, to put in. You know what he said? No. Give me the money today. Today. I was like, I judge. I was like, what are you stupid? He's like, no, I don't care. So I gave him his money because I didn't want you to have to You could not imagine so, how I, come somebody can think like no. this. Yeah. And, and I got into judgment because in my belief system, that was irrational. But here's the thing. He's sitting there and he's in his mind. He's saying, Kurt. You are the stupidest foreigner that I've ever met. You are are you God? You can't guarantee tomorrow. You can't guarantee that I'll have time to, to make a hundred. Hmm. Because in his world, he needed that money to be paid today, to feed his family today. And in his mind, I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Well. Now, if I would have understood that at that time, and I have to admit I didn't, if I would have understood that mindset. I would have worked with him to say, okay, here's the thing. Here's what I'll do. I'll pay you, and I'm going to give you eight more. And these, I, I need you to fix them right, and I'm going to show you how to fix them, but I'll pay you right away. I'm not going to say a hundred. I'll give you eight more. Mm. Because then I, I'm stretching his, his survival mentality out to a week. Once he trusts me with a week, I'll, I'll push it out and pay him in a month. And then I could have worked with him. But instead, I became judgmental, and I lost the opportunity to work with this man. That is, the mindset of survival is strong. And the thing is, it has worked for him. It worked for him. The fact that he's standing in front of me after all the war means that the survival mindset has worked. But what we found then was, of course, the survival mindset will, will not build a prosperous country right? And so you look around different countries, you look in Romania, more and more in America, you think, is there, I'm seeing survival mindset, short-term view, get the money done. If that continues, the people who have that mindset will never reach the vision that is in their heart. Because you can't build a prosperous nation day by day with limited. You have to be able to plan for the future. You have to think ahead. You have to be able to, um, you have to invest in quality. All of those things. And with survival mindset kills that. So that was a really powerful experience for me to recognize mindset. That is a limiting mindset. That's a limiting mindset for, for that man and for Afghanistan. So the question is, for you, for me, for the audience, what are the limiting mindsets that each of us has that is keeping us from reaching the vision that we have for ourselves or for our country? Well, in Romania, we have many limiting mindsets. We, we think that, for example, in the Christian uh, business people, we think uh, uh, that... Uh, money it's not something very good or the others outside think that money is not something very good wealth it's not okay if okay. you're wealthy it's going to be very hard for you to get in heaven uh business it's immoral um it's we we have limited resources and we have to fight for each other it's not okay to col collaborate because uh, if uh, the other ones will make will make the deal then i will go yeah. to lose yeah. so uh we have all this in uh, in romania but the question is how can we change uh, yeah. the mindset? How can we change the limitation? Because maybe some of them are coming very behind, uh, maybe from the parents, maybe from the gra grandparents. Right. We, right. we heard the stories all yeah. over. Yeah. It's uh, uh, somewhere very deep inside. It's deep. 
You know, my my leadership trainer, master trainer, said to me, for men, men almost always, the only way they will change is from crisis or trauma <laughs> or pain. And unfortunately, that is that is probably quite often true, that unless something is painful, we won't change. But I believe that the for myself, the most powerful motivator for shifting mindsets is vision. Hmm. Vision is the thing that if I look and I see that I have a vision to accomplish something, and I look and I look at my mindset, and it has worked for me up till now, like the survival mindset. It, it has, it, it's worked for me. Or in this case, you were talking about what I would say is the zero-sum view of life, which means there's always a winner and a loser. There's yes. never win-win. The pie is limited. Is, is limited. And if I give you a piece, I lose. And this is very prevalent. The only thing that is going to is going to shift that is to go, if I keep that mindset, that limited zero sum, I will never get to my, my vision. Example, we're growing this company in Afghanistan, going from zero to 200 million. We desperately need Afghans to delegate. So they wouldn't delegate. We're like, what is going on here? They wouldn't delegate. So we bring in a trainer. It's like, teach them how to delegate. So they, they learn the 21 laws of delegation, right? They, they memorize it. They're smart. They memorize it. They take the test. They get the, the, the certificate with a gold stamp on. They put it on the wall. They don't delegate. <laughs> Interesting. What we realized is that to them, delegation, which it is, is that when you delegate, you actually give a little bit of your power, your responsibility and power. You give it to somebody, but you are the assumption, the belief that you have is that by giving that, you actually will rise up, hmm. right? It's not zero sum. But in in a in a person who has a zero sum view of power, I am giving away my power. And in many countries, if you give away your power, you die. Yes. Or at minimum, you fail. There's not the sense that that the 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 pie of power can actually get bigger and bigger. But if you're trying to build a company, you better be able to delegate or you will top out. You cannot build a company beyond a certain if you can't learn to delegate and your people can't. So rather than coming in and, and trying to teach them the head knowledge of delegation, the skill of delegation, we have to recognize that's an action. The lack of delegation is an action. What is the belief that is at the core of that? It, most of the time, the belief is that I'm giving away power and I won't get it back and I die or I fail. So that has to shift. But the way it's going to have to shift is by having a bigger vision. The vision of growing my company to 200 million is a vision that if I can enroll people in that vision, that vision pulls them through the tension of shifting that belief. They recognize the belief. They say, if I keep that belief, I'll never grow. My vision is bigger. I have to shift that. And when a person sees that and has a strong enough vision, they will grow. So I've been asking in Romania, what is the vision of Romania? What will pull Romania to the next level? What's going to get it so that it becomes a full member of the EU? What is going to bring the shalom and catalyze shalom? What is that vision? Because if you don't have a strong vision, you'll just stay in your limiting mindsets because you're okay. You're, mm -hmm. it's, it's working for you. But you'll never get to your bigger vision. And so we've got to... We've got to to create and we've got to um, evangelize in a sense a bigger vision and, and enroll people in that vision then people will shift their mindsets and do you think that a greater vision 
it's enough to create trust and collaboration because in uh, for example in Romania we have also this challenge of trust and collaboration uh, and uh, we we don't really collaborate with each other everybody's building its own business yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, everybody's building their own kingdom and yeah. we are at this stage right now and yeah. uh, What do you think it's possible here? So so again what what I look at and this is this has just become something uh, in my life is trust or lack of trust mm. is a symptom. Okay. Lack of trust is a symptom and if we like if you have a if you have a sore or a, a wound an infected wound on your on your skin very often the problem is not right there if you just keep putting a plaster or whatever on it It's it's that's not the problem. Oftentimes it's something that's it's a systemic issue, okay? So what you have to look at is that trust or lack of trust is a symptom of something else. What is their belief about trust that keeps them from trusting? Hmm. What is my belief about trust that keeps me from trusting? Well, the issue is it it could be survival mentality, right? When you're in survival mentality, The way you survive is you don't trust anybody outside your family, outside your tribe, outside your city, whatever it is, you don't trust. That's the way you survive because when you trust, there is risk. Okay? But if the belief is I have to survive, 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 you'll never trust. But if there's a vision that says the only way I'm going to build my company or my country into something bigger is I have to trust and work in collaboration there's this it 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 pulls us into the future it pulls us through the tension of authentic trust which means that i can be betrayed but but the the risk is worth it because it's going to get me to my vision mm-hmm. if we keep telling people be trusting be trusting be trusting we're we're just putting a, a plaster on on the actual symptom It's the same with corruption. Corruption is a symptom. Corruption don't don't tell people don't be corrupt. People are corrupt because they believe they're rational. Most people, 99% of people are rational human beings. And therefore corruption is a choice that they make that they believe is the best choice of the ones that they have in front of them. A policeman who takes a bribe they need to take care of their family, right? And they're not being paid enough. What what options do they have? Hmm. So they have the choices of starving or taking a hundred lei or whatever from from a driver, right? If you were in that situation, if I was in that situation, we'd do the same thing because it's the best choice out of the possibilities. So if we work to increase the possibilities that there's actually a better possibility rational people will choose that possibility hmm. and so we 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 spend too much time working on the symptoms rather than working on the actual underlying belief of why people don't trust why people are zero sum that to me is the key Kurt, let's talk a little bit about uh, faith and business integration and how can we reduce the divide between uh, secular and divine. Uh, we have this big challenge here in Romania and I'm curious about your opinion. Yeah, it, it, is, <laughs> it is a challenge um, in America. It's a big challenge in Kenya. Yeah, it's... Um, we, need, we need to get back to the theology of it The way I look at it is I've been gifted. I believe I've been gifted by God to be an entrepreneur. I have a gift of creating value, of finding new ideas. That's a gift from God, I believe. Now, it's not listed in the Bible as one of the spiritual gifts, but if it's coming from God, it is a spiritual gift. It mm. is a, it's it's from God. And therefore, my Working out of that gifting is worship to God. It is worship to God. If somebody is gifted as a as a pastor, that is worship to God. If I'm gifted as an entrepreneur, that is worship to God. Therefore, I need to do it with all of my effort, with all of my character, with everything in me, because that's my gifting, and it needs to glorify God. 
And what needs to happen then is the people who have pastoral gifts or um, they have they work in the church, if they recognize that that gifting is from the same God and that it is part of the body of Christ coming together and they celebrate business, then we see it as an integrated package. Now, on a practical level, I will say to a, a pastor, I'll say, how many hours a week do you have influence over your flock? What is it? Two hours, hmm. three hours a week that you, that you actually can speak into their life and influence? Four hours maybe? I, as a business owner, have people that I interact with and influence eight hours a day every day. Tell me that that is not an opportunity for discipleship, for character building, for being in the mud. What was Jesus? He was in the mud with his disciples mm -hmm. every day when they were sweating, when they were hurt, when they were sad. And as a business owner, I can be in the mud with my employees whether they are believers or not, with the believers, I'm discipling them. With the ones who are not believers, I'm, I am demonstrating the love of Jesus. I'm demonstrating the justice. I'm demonstrating the hands and feet of Jesus. Therefore, I am a pastor to them. I am pastoring them. I'm discipling them. That is beautiful to me. And the church has, the, has a special place and special gifting that also then complements that but I've got a lot more hours with them than any pastor. And so I think if we can shift that and we can see it the way Jesus sees it, we start to bring that sacred secular divide and we eliminate it. It's, it's in America too. And it's a theology that, that is really, I believe it's of the devil. I believe it's a deception of the devil that, that, the church is looking at business people as the ATM machine. You know, they love the business people when there's money, but they're not seeing the business people as gifted and ministering. And that to me is missing the power of the gifting of God in business. It's a shame. And I'm not saying that the pastors have bad intentions that they're bad people at all. They're wonderful. But I think the theology needs to shift that we start looking at each other as co-ministers. And they're doing one thing, you're doing, but they're co-ministers. What, we, you know, we entrepreneurs are asking for, for the support, the blessing of our pastors to be saying, go, minister, Make money, but but it use it as a tool for winning, for being the hands and feet of Jesus. It's not just a tool to give money into the church. If we could shift that, I think we would unleash a lot of entrepreneurs who feel a bit, they almost have to hide their gifting. And I'm like, God gave me that gifting. Does that, yeah, does that wow, make sense? That, that would be amazing. It to would. To make that shift and to unleash so many resources and so much energy that would yeah. be there in the body of Christ. And well, and I, I think... Creativity I make, and... Creativity. <laughs> I make an appeal to pastors to to really look. Watch watch the, um, watch the, the chosen mm. and see how Jesus was in the mud and, and see that there's a place for entrepreneurs to be in the mud and celebrate it. I'd call for pastors to have a change of that belief and, and to unleash uh, an amazing, amazing force for the gospel. Wow. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. We, we, we are going to the last question now. And uh, I'm very curious if you can share with us um, uh, what you, have you learned about God in uh, this season of your life? Yeah, it's a good, um, oftentimes God do, doesn't work on our timeline, hmm. right? And this is not just business people, it's just generally. And I can get to a place where I'm like, God, are you, are you working? I was, I was talking with, um, 
a very high net worth investor. And I was trying to share this, this, the, the vision and was trying to share this holistic and, and, and he, and he said to me, we're too small. We, he just, he, he just didn't have the vision. And that night I, I woke up at three in the morning and I woke up Katrina and I wept and I wept at my inability to, to, to speak in a way that this man would move this man to release the resources that God had given him. I wept at my inability. I wept at his, at his, at his small thinking. And God said to me, Kurt, stop crying. There's a time for crying. Stop crying. Get up off the floor. And tomorrow, I want you to just be obedient tomorrow. You leave the results to me. Mm -hmm. If you are obedient tomorrow, and then you're obedient the next day, and you take steps, whatever steps are in front of you, I love this vision more than you do. I gave it to you, Kurt, and I love it more than you. So don't get impatient. Don't feel like it depends on you. Just be faithful. And that has been a powerful thing for me as I've gotten impatient and I've just been like, God, the, the operators are ready to go in mm. the market. You're ready to go. And the resources are being bottled up and not released in the same way the operators are ready to execute the vision. God is at work. And God's timing is perfect. And I need to be patient. I need to believe in his sovereignty. I need to believe that he cares more than I do. And just take the next step in obedience and leave it up to him. Wow. Thank you so much, Kurt. We really appreciate your experience. And uh, we were blessed with all your stories. And uh, we are so grateful to see how God used, to, used you in all these frontier markets. And it's a real blessing to have you here. And thank you so much for your time and investment coming here in Romania. This is a real blessing for us. And uh, here at Guild Faith, we, we try to help entrepreneurs to live their faith mm. and to integrate their faith in their business. And we pray to uh, be part of a movement uh, here in Romania and maybe in other frontier markets and to help with uh, everything that is possible. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> I am humbled to be here. You, I am humbled to be here. And I have great belief that Romania is going to set an example for the rest of the world in this, in this area. So blessings to you. Thank you, Kurt.